That's what Bitcoin's all about, right? This is, yeah. It's the biggest why ever, as far as the material real world is concerned. We have to fix the money. If we want to create a human civilization that is sustainable and human flourishing is our metric, then we have to fix the money. There's yeah. no other way to do it. You can't, there's literally no other way. So as, Bit, as a Bitcoiner, you get very impassioned about this, but I think it's for good reason. Everything else is hollow. I think it is extremely telling that the man that is so loving and compassionate in all his interactions throughout all of the Bible sets all of that aside one time and goes into absolute rage mode, flipping over the tables and chasing the money changers out of the marketplace. That the one exception for Christ to get mad in the Bible is at the money changers. Like you have to listen to that. You have to at least wonder why, why the money changers? Why was he so mad at the money changers? We are live here from Bitcoin Beach with Robert Breedlove. One of the things I love about living in El Zante is I was just sitting on my porch today talking to <laughs> a, a new buddy, a Bitcoiner that I met, and who rolls up other than Robert Breedlove uh, along with Chimbera. And uh, yeah, that's what it's like living in El Zante. First time I've ever met Robert in person. I heard him speak the night before at uh, the event that um, Max Kaiser put on. But uh, yeah, that's what it's like living in El Zante. It's being at a nonstop Bitcoin conference. So welcome, Robert. Very happy to be here. And yeah, that was kind of cool. Um, he stopped me to sign a waiver for a documentary that we recorded over a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, hey, you want to go over here to Mike's house? I'm like, yeah, sure. So super cool. Yeah. So we don't have a, uh, a real agenda for this. It was impromptu, but uh, excited to kind of delve into the weeds with you. But first, I want to just get your impression of El Salvador. I don't know how much you knew about what was going on before you came down, but would love to hear about your conceptions before you arrived and how that's changed or how those have been affirmed once you arrived. Yeah, I, I've only been here for barely over 24 hours, so I don't have a huge piece of experience to share yet. But um, man, it's beautiful down here. Uh, we're staying right in the same area. So we're like next door to your house. Um, You're at Garten, right? Garten. Yeah. It's Gar beautiful hotel. Garten Zante. Yeah. Garten okay. El Zante. Yeah. Beautiful Garten hotel. Garten Zante. Beautiful. It's right on the beach. We surfed today. It's How really was the nice. It's very warm. It's like bath water. Yeah. Um, well, I say surfed. I just tried to surf for a little <laughs> while. Um, it's really nice. Took a walk. Very good vibe. Everyone's just playing on the beach, having a good time. Um, I don't know that I had really any expectations for El Salvador. I have a distant memory, I think, of El Salvador just being regarded as like a brutal place, you know? I don't know, five, 10 years ago, people used to say that. Was it Was it the murder capital of the world at some point? Yeah, Something? for like a decade, it went back and forth between El Salvador and Honduras of who had the distinction of being the highest uh, murder rate in the world. Wow. Yeah. So I would assume that means the property here is trading at a deep discount <laughs> as they recover from that reputational damage. But the weather's perfect. Good vibe, good people. Um, had a really good time at the event last night. Max and Stacey threw a great party. Seems like uh, El Salvador is winning, as Max keeps saying. <laughs> and, I, you know, this is exciting to see an experiment like this up close because we've we as in Bitcoiners like think and argue and talk about all this game theory of, of Bitcoin and how nation states will ultimately adopt it. And it's interesting to see it happening up close, just that there's a real live experiment to participate in, be a part of. Um, it just adds to that feeling, I, like you were talking about offline, that Bitcoin gives you that opportunity to participate in something much larger than yourself, something that's actually seems to be working. And, um, that seems to be real here, you know? There's like a historical something happening, perhaps. 
so yeah that's 24 hours it's a good vibe have you uh have you spent any bitcoin yet have you dropped any sats i have not actually um i paid for the room in cash physical cash and then i've just been booking everything to the room since so but tomorrow we're supposed to go to the bitcoin beach community i think that's where we're going to do some okay. sat spending yeah no you definitely gotta gotta throw some sats around while you're here yeah, yeah. we always a lot of Bitcoiners are like, no, I want to spend my cash. It's like, hey, just spend in Bitcoin <laughs> and replace yeah. because that's the way we get this circulating. I buy enough Bitcoin every day that I can spend some sats and it won't matter. <laughs> Still be a net buyer. I'll um, I'll be curious, you know, more towards the end of your trip, if you if your things have shifted it for you at all coming here because it's. A lot of people coming in, they tend to initially react one way or the other or one like, oh, this is not nearly as significant as I thought. I thought I would be able to use Bitcoin at every single shop mm. that I went to. And I went to two places that didn't want to accept Bitcoin or people on the other hand that, oh, wow, I'm surprised at how easily I could do mm -hmm. everything I wanted to do in Bitcoin. And it, it seems to be a correlation that the more OG Bitcoiners, the people who have been in it for the longer tend to be more impressed. And mm. I think that's because there's been such a long road of used to be you were excited if there was one place that accepted right. Bitcoin. Yeah. So for them to have all these different choices and a map with hundreds of locations they could spend, they to them that's significant. To people that are newer, they're like, well, I, I thought it was supposed to be accepted everywhere and it's not yeah. being. And so it'll be interesting to see what you take away at the end. How long, how long are you here for? Uh, I'm here for two more days. Okay. So this is a short trip. I just wanted to come down here. It was impromptu um as you said earlier but max was like hey we're throwing a party i was like all right i've got the days open i'll come down um i did see the app actually at dinner tonight right before this and it looks really slick right you pull up map of the beach it's got little pins dropped for everyone that accepts bitcoin um the the guy that uh runs the hotel was saying you can pay through the app yeah. and everything yeah so. you can pop it'll just pop up a lightning invoice for you by yeah. hitting the pin on the map so you don't have to scan any qr code yeah. or anything which makes it that actually came from we have a lot of small store owners here that were using it and a lot of them are kind of one man one woman shows and so like the pupuserias for example they're yeah. they're in there they're making all their food and they were complaining hey when somebody pays in bitcoin I have to stop. I have to go find my phone. I have to create an invoice. Right. It's quicker to take cash. Yeah. And so my belief is we really need to make Bitcoin easier to spend mm -hmm. than cash. And fortunately, the, the guys from Galloy, they came in and they developed that map function. So now the person, the patron can just click on the map and do that all. And then they get a little, the owner gets a little ding on their phone and they confirm that the sats were received. So that's great. It works really nice. Yeah. Yeah. It looked slick. Um, uh, yeah, it just seems kind of ideal, right? You come to a little beach town, you don't really know what's on offer. You just pull up the app and see everywhere you can spend your sats. And a pretty easy flight for you to get down here? Piece of cake for me. So Nashville to Miami, two and a half hours. Miami, I'm sorry, one and a half hours. El Sal Miami to El Salvador is two and a half hours. Yeah. So four hours, no problem. No, that's what I think a lot of people think of El Salvador as being like way far <laughs> away, but it's quicker to get to El Salvador from LA than it is to go to DC. I mean, it's, yeah. it's very easy and yeah. we're on the same time as I, th I think it, they don't do daylight uh, savings here. So I think right now we're on central time. So it's, uh, but it's nice to be on the same time. You know, a lot of times when you travel, right. you're trying to juggle the time zones Yeah, here. If you're working remotely, it's very easy. Nobody knows you're even gone. So. Yeah. 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 I lived in Hawaii for a while and that was a real pain actually. They also don't do the time, daylight savings time. So you're like part but of the they're year. They're like six hours difference or something. Well, right? part of the year and then part of the year you're five. five. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's confusing. No, I've I've had issues with that here because I'll have an appointment in the U.S. and I won't even be thinking about mm -hmm. the time changing because yeah. it doesn't. And they're like, hey, how come you didn't show up for yeah. the meeting? I'm like, no, it's in 30 minutes. Like, <laughs> no. So yeah, it's yeah. kind of funny. Um. What is what is on your agenda for the the time you're down here other than the party? I know you were speaking at the party the other night. Yeah. But uh, any thoughts of coming back to El Salvador for any longer amount of time or just kind of curious what your thoughts yeah, are? Yeah, I was like I was telling you at your house earlier, like I love being on the beach. I've always liked living on the beach, um, but needed to move back to Nashville to have like a firm firm foundation in case anything gets sideways in the world again. So 
currently that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is like I need to need to have a base in Nashville, but then I'd like to be somewhere on the ocean the rest of the year. And obviously, um, Bitcoin is my livelihood, so I would love to be in Bitcoin country. And um, thinking about this winter time, maybe we can come down here and spend a few months, do some what is money recording here. Um, obviously, just still kind of early days, not exactly sure. Got, got a lot to learn, <laughs> but I really enjoyed my time here so far. The rest of this trip, tomorrow we've got a meeting um, in San Salvador, and then I fly back the next day. So it was really coming down here to see Max and Stacy see how the Bitcoin community is doing, see how Bitcoin Beach Project's working and um, test it out. You know, like I was going to come down here solo before I brought my family or anyone else. So this was the the test flight, if you will. Was that because you had any apprehensions just because yeah. of the, the crime in the past and the reputation that El Salvador has? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a young daughter, so yeah. I wouldn't just, you know, willy nilly take her to El Salvador having never been. Yeah. Yeah. After being here for a day, not that that's enough to make. Uh, uh, Those know. kids running around everywhere, yeah. all over the beach, <laughs> playing. Yeah, it seems very peaceful. Um, I've had no bad vibes whatsoever since I've been here. So it uh, seems like a cool place. No, I raised my kids here. And for me, this is home. So yeah. It's, uh, but it's always interesting to hear the different perceptions people have. And, yeah. and, but to see how much that's changing. I mean, it used to be a few years ago. I couldn't get friends to come down. Now they're like, hey, is your place available? Yeah, I want to yeah, come visit. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all those factors we were talking about earlier, too, right? With the, the move to remote work post COVID, all the government insanity and largely in the, the Western world, right? Canada and the US, yeah. the printing of money, like all of these things, these are all violations of people's property rights and a new, there's a new technological paradigm that you can kind of live anywhere and still work, not for everyone, but for a lot of people. Yeah. So it seems to me like places like this that were trading at a discount because of their prior reputations perhaps could do really well in the future. So and we're seeing, I mean, I I'm I'm shocked at the number of people that come here sight unseen. They haven't even visited and they mm -hmm. sell everything, move from New Zealand or the Middle East or I mean, we're seeing people from all over the world yeah. that it's uh, I think we're in the early stages of that. It's become you know, the the new freedom zone for people yeah. that are looking to escape governments they're concerned about. Yeah, and that's that's the dynamic I think will continue to unfold, right? That freedom freedom zones are gonna be trading at a premium. Um, Cause you know, when you look historically, when governments start engaging in this process of printing money and uh, say drifting towards authoritarianism in general, it doesn't really, stop until something breaks right there's either a social revolution or something major um and i don't something i don't bad usually <laughs> well yeah until good typically yeah. prevails but i don't see the western world kind of doing a 180 i mean i hope i really do hope um yeah i tweeted about this earlier today but like the uh the freedom convoy in canada you know the largest peaceful protest in Canada's history. Canada is supposed to be like one of the top five liberal democracies in the world. How did they respond to this? You know, people expressing their democratic rights in a peaceful protest. How did the state respond? Well, they froze their bank accounts and they froze the bank accounts of all the contributors. So like that, that's a very bad precedent. And then when that happened, all the other leaders in the Western world were just silent, like no one said a thing about it. So that's really bad. Yeah. That's, um, I don't think that's going to stop happening, right? When COVID 2.0 or whatever the next fucking climate change, pandemic, heart attack nonsense they spiel, um, there's, they're gonna push people harder. They have a roadmap now. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That's the strategy. It's encroach a little bit until you encounter resistance and then back off for yeah. a couple of years and then encroach a little more and back off. There's literally books written about this, right? Seeing like a state dictator's playbook. Um, it, it's textbook, literally. No, the, the thing in Canada, that actually really surprised me. I mean, as an American, you kind of always view Canada as a place where they would kind of welcome those type of things. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize the degree of repression in the government there. And mm -hmm. we've had a flood of Canadians that have come into El Zante and El Salvador, but a lot of them have, have headed to El Zante. And so just kind of 
listening to their journey over the last 10 years of a country that they they felt like would be their home for their life to and within a decade feeling like they don't recognize it anymore yeah yeah it's things can change quickly so you have to really pay attention to the warning signs and I mean, I think this COVID one caught everyone off guard, caught me off guard, right? Like I was spending my career reading, writing, talking about this stuff, but the pace with which it all changed was just mind boggling. I was living in Los Angeles at the time and Los Angeles went from a place that I really enjoyed living in the United States to like a communist nightmare. Like it's overnight, it was just very quick. So, um, you know, I think it's just important for people to be aware what's going on. There's very large tectonic shifts happening in our political and economic environment and to be prepared for all eventualities because there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. So, um, yeah, options, you need options, right? When there's a lot of uncertainty, you need options. I think that more than even more than people that are actually moving to El Salvador full time, we are seeing a lot of people that are coming in for that option. They want to mm -hmm. have a property that they can escape to. Maybe they still plan on spending most of the year in the U.S. or Canada, mm -hmm. but they want to have a landing spot that yeah. when it all hits the fan, they can, you know, hop on a plane before before the borders are shut and, right. and get back down here. Yeah, I mean, that's what obviously stacking sats is a huge way to build some optionality in terms of purchasing power. But then you also need this jurisdictional optionality whether it's multiple passports or multiple residency cards, whatever it may be. Um, I think that's just going to be really important because we don't know, right? We don't know which nation's going to flip at what point. So it's nice to have options. Yeah. So I'm curious on your experience uh, or your participation in the Thank God for Bitcoin book. I think that was the first time I was really exposed to, to your name and to, um, to some of your work. And I know from the authors of that book, there would be a wide range of religious backgrounds mm -hmm. and um, some that would consider themselves Christians, others that, that wouldn't. And so I'm curious as to how it was working on that book together. Was there a lot of agreement of what should be in and what shouldn't, or was it a contentious process? Or I, I, I find it remarkable. I, I worked on a book project 20 years ago with, with three good friends who agreed on everything. And uh -huh. that was a tough process. So <laughs> I'm curious how, was there eight of you that were working Eight on? of us, yeah. yeah. So yeah. how was that process to have eight of you with very different backgrounds working on that? Yeah, so I guess we, first of all, it started out, it was a Bitcoin and Bible book club. We we're doing it over Zoom. This was throughout COVID. Um, so we had read books like The Ethics of Money Production by Holzman. We read Honest Money by Gary North maybe one other one. And after we would just read, you know, a couple chapters, meet once a week, talk, uh, which was- And were you guys friends before that? Or how did well, that so group come together? It's Jimmy Song was kind of, actually who connected me? Uh, Stephen Cole, a friend of mine, just suggested that I join the book club because mm -hmm. it was during COVID. I wanted some, you know, you're not going to church, you're not meeting, you're not doing anything communal. So yeah. it was like a nice outlet for that. And uh, Jimmy Song, I think, organized it originally, but I'm not sure. I jumped into the book club kind of like partway through. And um, after we did that, we did those two books. We'd been meeting for maybe, I don't know, 12, 14 weeks, something like that. Jimmy just suggested, hey, why don't, why don't we write a book? Um, he had done a similar collaborative book effort before. So he had this kind of this playbook or template for how to do it. And so that was very fortunate, like, you, you know, there was a process like you describe your ideal audience member everyone did this individually then we kind of compared notes there was a storyboarding phase where we you know took different terms and concepts that we thought were relevant and a number of these exercises that helped us really get our thinking straight before we started writing and then we just wrote um we laid out you know the structure of the book would be i think we had nine chapters um planned i think that's what it came out to be too so we just each of us wrote, you know, each one person gets assigned a chapter to write and then you rotate or one, one to write and one to edit each week and then you rotate. Um, and we just did that. Basically, you keep revising. And then obviously, 
the question was, was it contentious? I would say not really at all because we had a good framework in place. Yeah. Obviously, there were plenty of times where we're butting heads like, oh, this sentence should go. The sentence is too verbose. Let's cut but it was down. Was that more on like writing styles or or religious beliefs and, and the way you were coming out? No, of? I feel like the religious, we're all, the idea of the book was to write a treatise on the importance of Bitcoin in the context of the history of money uh, through a moral ethical lens with a Christian emphasis, right? So it's like we we were coming at it that way. Okay. We all knew it. So there wasn't a lot of debate about that per se. Um, we also wanted to make it very accessible, like not, which is, if you've ever read my work, I'm like the opposite. <laughs> like I write, I'm long winded when I talk, I write these long verbose sentences and use esoteric words and all this shit. So they kept, like, they'd make fun of me. They call me Professor Breedlove. I'm like, all right, Professor Breedlove, we're going to take your sentence and turn it into like 12 sentences. Um, but that was really, it came out really good. And, you know, I have to credit Jimmy with that one. He gave it the voice of like, um, uh, who's the author of Mere Christianity? C.S. Lewis. Yeah, it's almost got like a C.S. Lewis type voice. It's very clear, Yeah. short sentences, but but potent Um it was cohesive. It didn't yeah. feel sometimes when you have projects where you have multiple authors, it right. feels like this wasn't really a book. This is just essays that were thrown together. Yeah, and we and we we put a lot of pressure on it to get that cohesion, right? Like we did we got to a point where like, okay, the book's pretty good. Should we give it another revision? And, you know, we put well, like, yes, we should revise this thing two or three more times. And I think it really put that nice polish on it. And look, I think the product hopefully speaks for itself. It's like a one or two hour read. It's written in a very accessible voice and it covers a lot of ground, right? It goes from like, what is money? Like the same thing I do on the show, like what is money? Why did gold become money? How do governments corrupt it and screw it up? How does Bitcoin fix all this? So the subtitle of the book is the creation, corruption and redemption of money. And I, you know, I think it's a good entry point for people into the Bitcoin rabbit hole and, um, Hopefully with the emphasis on the dimension that I think is most important, which is the moral ethical dimension of money, right? It's these, ins it's broken incentives that break yeah. human behavior and lead us to broken civilization. So, um, which we see firsthand in El Salvador, where you have all these people that have to flee the country in order to work because yeah. the economy is so broken because a lot of it, because of the influence of the U S and them controlling the, the money system. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the book, really hit hard because I've seen these things firsthand of people not growing up with their children or not their children not being able to see their kids take their first steps or to be there for them when they're going to school because they're in the U.S. working some dead-end job because they right. can't make a living here because of the broken fiat system. Right. So for me, when I read that book, it, it really hit hard. Yeah, well, I see the tears in your eyes talking about it. And um, I mean, that's... It's what Bitcoin's all about, right? It's, this, yeah. it's the biggest why ever, as far as the material real world is concerned. It, we have to fix the money. If we want to create a human civilization that is sustainable and human flourishing is our metric, then we have to fix the money. There's yeah. no other way to do it. You can't, there's literally no other way. So as, Bit, as a Bitcoiner, you get very impassioned about this, but I think it's for good reason. Because I don't, everything else is hollow, right? You can talk about it and you can fucking pass another law or put another guy in office or move to this country. Like you're never going to fix the core, right? It's, it's, what is that old saying that for every thousand hacking at the leaves, there's one strike at the root, you know, the, and Bitcoin is the yeah, strike right. at the root. It's like human beings are, are, are individual paths of character development and our moral composition is an emergent property or a reflection of the incentive structures that we inhabit. Like we become the incentive structures that we inhabit. And we've been pouring ourselves into really bad incentive structures over time. And that's why I think, I mean, what fiat medicine, fiat food, fiat culture, fiat fashion, fiat art, fiat architecture. It's like when you get this new lens, right? You get these orange colored lenses on the world. You just see everything so much differently and you feel like we're kind of back in a economic dark age of some kind. And a few of us have seen the light. So we're like, guys, wake the fuck up, like fix the money, fix the world.
And I think that's what people misunderstand because they're like, oh, you guys are only about money, but they're talking about money in the fiat sense of thinking it through that yes. lens. And so they're like, how can you be that passionate or yes. be that concerned about this, you know, when there's real problems out there? Yes. But like you're saying, they don't understand a lot of these problems. The root of it is this corrupted money system right. that we have. Yeah. And so do you want to just go after the, the symptoms of that illness or do you want to go right to the root of it so you can actually change the future or how these things manifest yeah. in the future? And so that's where I think outside the Bitcoin space, there's a big misconception about our excitement about Bitcoin. It has nothing to do with lambos right, or buying right, right. fancy things it has to do with, with really with justice it is justice yeah. absolutely thank you for saying that um justice means people getting what they deserve right so isn't that exactly what the idea of private ownership private property is like you keep the things you create you keep the value you create you can trade it with other people that have also kept the value they themselves have created and through that process we create economic abundance, human flourishing. Well, what is the state doing? The state is undoing that process. And I know it's complicated. It, we, we say it's black or white. We say it as if it's black or white, but it's obviously not. Maybe we needed statism, right? To have property rights, to get us to this level of evolutionary development. But I don't think we should just accept that as the final version of human organization, right? We can do better. And that's what Bitcoin is, like the first step to doing something way better, that there's a symmetry of the value you create and the value you keep. So it's you, you're actually getting what you deserve. And it, what's that quote uh, on Twitter that everyone gets Bitcoin at the price, price they, they deserve. deserve. Like yeah. that's justice, yeah. honestly. Um, it's brutal, right? It's kind of hard and it's justice is blind and all of these things. But yeah, if you want a just world, you have to have a monetary system that's not based on information asymmetry. It's not based on a legal monopoly, right? A legal monopoly is a power asymmetry. It's we inside of this monopoly get to print the money and we have the laws and the guns around us pointed out at you that are forced to use the money. Like that's, that's a fundamental schism that will never support a sustainable human civilization. And yet that's what runs the world right now, just currency counterfeiting thing. So Bitcoin is justice in a very pure sense. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe people get on to Bitcoiners because it does have that get rich quick scheme veneer, but underneath it's this, this humanitarian movement we're describing. And maybe people... Actually, this question comes up to me a lot when I'm on other podcasts. I say, oh, well, you know, you're really into the history of money and all that. But like, isn't money the root of all evil? Like, they always want to throw that one at you. And you're like, well, first of all, <laughs> first of all, <laughs> it's the love, love of, of money, money. Yeah. is the root of all evil. And it's not it's not like Bitcoiners love. I mean, love. Love is such a loaded word, right? Yeah. We're fascinated with Bitcoin. We're proponents of Bitcoin. Um we advocate for it as justice, right? And a fair system of property rights for 8 billion people that can't be violated, all of these things. That doesn't mean I love Bitcoin. I'm like, oh, you know, I want more Bitcoin too. I want to stack more sats, right? There's nothing wrong with that per se, but the idea of loving worldly things, right? To, to willingly inflict harm on someone to gain a worldly thing, like that's evil, right? And so if money is considered kind of this uh, call option on all worldly things, right? Anything that the market can produce, money can buy. If you love money for its own sake, then yeah, that's pretty fucking evil. And I would say the people that really love money for its own sake tend to be uh, shareholders of central banks or statists or bureaucrats, right? Those are the people that are actually inflicting harm on others for their own private gain. So generating socialized losses for private gain. That is evil. Um, I think Bitcoin and Bitcoiners are a counterforce to all of that nonsense. So how do you think is the best way to explain that to people? Because that's one thing I've run into is they, there's a total misunderstanding of why we're so passionate and excited about these things, because like I said, they're seeing it through that lens of, oh, you want to get rich to have a fancier car. It's like, no, I want people to be able to stay home and raise their kids and not have to be. Yeah 
you know, travel a thousand miles away because they can't make a living in their own country. So I really do think that as Bitcoiners, we need to do a better job of explaining what it is that we're so passionate about, because I think if they could see what drives Bitcoiners, there'd be a lot more people in the Bitcoin camp. Yeah, you know, I, I feel very passionate about this, too. All of my work tries to focus on the why of Bitcoin, um, which we're speaking to here. I thought for the longest you could just explain like the nature of private property. You know, it's like, look, everyone wants to know that they have this strong relationship between the things, their assets and themselves. Right. And that no one's going to steal their shit and we can all go out and just work and trade peaceably. I thought if you could just connect that notion, which is already very confusing, because when I use the word property, people think I'm talking about real estate, not talking about the relationship between owners and assets. I thought that if you could just edify the concept of private property and then the learning I thought that was necessary was when you print money or you counterfeit currency, you're actually violating property rights, right? Like whoever's saving in dollars, when new dollars are printed, you're violating the property rights of dollar savers. The first recipients of those dollars are extracting wealth from the savers in dollars. This is the Cantillon effect, right? It's the redistributive property of inflation. Seems pretty straightforward to me. It's like, look, you, you wanna own the stuff. If someone prints money that you're forced to use, they're stealing your stuff. And that creates all of this uh, conflict and, and whatnot in the world. Bitcoin is just advocating for money that you can't print, right? So it's not, obviously we still have the unsolved problem of physical property in the real world, like your relationship with things. You need some type of physical security provider or yourself, you have to defend those assets to have a high integrity relationship with them. That's still a problem, right? But money, right? The most important asset that most any of us deal with, we can now have a very strong property relationship there at least. But man, the word, words are tricky because again, I've, I've almost, I, I, I want to get away from the term private property because of what I said earlier, people think it's the asset rather than the relationship. I'm starting to use the term private ownership. Um, but there's this other piece of resistance where people like advocate, they think we're in late stage capitalism. So they think that the world that's burning all around us, which is late stage central banking is somehow attributable to capitalism, capitalism and private property rights. So I'm like really fighting an uphill battle. Like people are like fucking down, down with the private property rights, down with capitalism. And you're like, actually, we need way more of that and way less of uh, this aggression, this institutionalized policy of aggression against private property, which is socialism. That's what socialism is. It's like people are going to steal your shit to try and pass some political agenda. And I don't know, like it's, this sounds ridiculous, but the word socialism just sounds more friendly than the word capitalism. People like to be social. People don't really know what capital is. It's mysterious. So I think there are a lot of demagogues that prey on that ignorance and just that relationship with vernacular even. So I'm constantly, like I said, I'm ready to give up private property. I'll call it private ownership. Hopefully that makes more sense. Um, rather than referring to it as socialism, like you just focus on Socialism being that institutionalized policy of aggression against private ownership. Like, would you like that? Would you like if someone came in your home and took your stuff and took your car? Like, no, you don't want, you want to own your stuff. So why would you tolerate the centralization and counterfeiting of currency yeah. that's taking other people's stuff? Like, well, it's weird because they're, they're like, yeah, but they're not really, you're like, no, it'd be no, like, they if, are. if you own your house and there's a hundred parts to your house that you own and they go ahead and make it 200 parts and take why, half of that. You only have half the house at that point. 100%. Okay. Why does the state outlaw counterfeiting? Right? If counterfeiting is not a violation of someone's stuff and you're not stealing from someone, why is it illegal? Okay. Okay. It makes sense. Probably should be illegal. Okay. Why does the central bank a legally authorized currency counterfeiting monopoly? And it's the anti-capitalistic institution that's at the heart of every modern capitalist economy in the world, capitalism, big air quotes. I mean, it's, it's, it's oxymoronic, right? We're just deceiving ourselves. And it's, again, I, economic dark ages. I don't know what else to call it. So what can we do? Uh, stack sats, you know, be expensive to tyranny and hopefully have conversations like this that are educational, right? That I find myself just getting back to 
ancient documents, right? Like the Magna Carta, life, liberty, inviolable property, or the Federalist Papers, like the things the founding fathers talked about. All of the foundational materials of Western civilization, it's like we built this huge ivory tower of, you know, we're in the ultimate lap of luxury. In terms of history, right? We live longer than anyone. We eat better. We travel further. We work less. Like we, if you look at humans across all of history, we are royalty, yeah. right? All of us, even you know, at, at every level. Ex if you have a refrigerator, yeah. you're fucking yeah. royalty, right? You can store food for months. Like that was not possible just even a couple yeah. hundred years ago. So it's as if we built this ivory tower of sorts and we've become arrogant or ignorant or a combination of both. And now we're attacking those very foundations with these ideas, these very corrosive ideas like wokeism and Marxism and all this shit. So it's a very uphill battle, but I don't think you can, there's not much of a counter argument, right? If you argue in favor of any of this, you're just arguing in favor of theft. You think, if you think socialism is necessary to any degree, you think we need to steal from people for civilization to work. I, you're broken. You're, you don't understand. I don't know. I, you don't need, like, theft does not add to productivity. The time you spend stealing from someone is time you could spend building something yeah. or doing something. So you're actually subtracting from aggregate productivity with every act of theft. It's hard to believe it in this day and age. There's still people that believe in this zero sum game theory that right. there's just a certain amount out there, and our job is to divide it up right. rather than the, the real understanding of yeah of economics. 100. percent So I think that's the same thing that we keep battling. That's why I think we keep having these same type of ideologic battles that keep going around without making any progress. Yeah, it's very frustrating, and um, you're also you know, you're trying to educate people that don't get, I don't, I hesitate to even say that. I try to learn about what's actually happening, right? Like why, why, why? Like a three-year-old just asking why all the way to the bottom. And I invite people along for the journey as I'm learning, like I may speak very emphatically or strongly, but these are things that I'm just trying to learn over yeah. time. I'm not here to really impose a belief. Please ask questions and poke holes <laughs> in it wherever it is. But People aren't getting any of that type of education or authentic dialogue in the traditional educational system. They get none of it, right? Like I have a master's degree in accounting and finance. I never learned about the nature of money. I was never taught about central banking. I was never, you know. Which is crazy, it's crazy. crazy. That is the basis of everything about how our current financial yes. system works. And the supposed experts in it have no understanding. Nothing, no Austrian economics. That's bizarre. And it's in the economics, the Keynesian economics textbooks from college, it's like the government issues or the central bank issues currency into circulation and takes it out. There's no even perspective on the opportunity cost faced by that organization. It doesn't even, it, it's deified, frankly, in the textbooks, right? It's like this and is And you a, think it happened forever, like since the beginning of right. time, this is how money And they was. say things like it's independent, it's yeah. apolitical. I'm like, you know there's human beings running that motherfucker, right? Like, where, what have you ever seen Totally independent, apolitical human beings that have no interest in the real world. And we just manage the money supply in your interest for your protection. <laughs> just like we wear masks for our protection or stay in lockdown for our protection. Like it's all the same story. Yeah. And I think that that's, that is why there's so much excitement and hope in the Bitcoin community because they, they feel like wow, there actually is a solution to this. There is the ability to unshackle yeah. human beings that that really have been enslaved in the, the way this current system works. Yeah. And we were talking a little bit before that I, I'm hesitant to, to make the comparison because I think there's big distinctions. But for me, it reminds me a little bit of the hope and excitement I saw, have seen at times in the, the church where people, mm -hmm. especially with young people, mm -hmm. when there'd be times of revival of them being very excited and, and passionate because they they see a chance to go out and make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not trying to equate the two. I I, I love, uh, I, I like Bitcoin, it's very important to me, mm -hmm. but I love God and that is, for mm -hmm. me, that those are two yeah. big distinctions. But I do think um, there's interesting parallels of seeing the excitement of people wanting to be about something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what draws people into Bitcoin, not some, you know, who, 
who really cares to have a Lambo? I mean, the reality is uh, they're, they're a car that you're worried about all the time and breaking down. That's not what drives people. <laughs> right. I know it's a joke and a meme in, in the community, but yeah. that's not what really hardly anybody aspires no, to have. Not no. that there's anything wrong with it, but it's, it's I know it's a shallow. ton of it's, rich it's Bitcoiners. Yeah. I don't think I know anyone that owns a Lambo. Like, <laughs> it was silly. Um, I, there's so much I could say about this. Like, Okay, first of all, the one time when I just like independent of your religious beliefs or whatever, you could say that Christ in the Bible, it, whatever, whether historicity aside, mythology aside, religion aside, he's meant to represent like the perfect human consciousness, right? He's just, he's pure love. Right? He's meeting the worst, like it's an archetypal story as Jordan Peterson would always say, like you take the worst possible thing that could happen to a human and the best possible imaginable, imaginable response to that situation. And like that you've abstracted from all the possible stories that humans could face this ultimate pure um, hero, right? He's the ultimate hero. He's the meta hero, right? So we talk about the hero's journey all the time and whatnot. Well, Christ is the meta hero in a way. I think it is extremely telling that the man that is so loving and compassionate in all his interactions throughout all of the Bible sets all of that aside one time and goes into absolute rage mode, flipping over the tables and chasing the money changers out of the marketplace. Right? That they, to me, that says these individuals that are tampering with the weights and measures, which are the coordinating and a the mechanisms by which we coordinate and adapt ourselves to economic reality, when you attack that, right, the language of value it's, itself, you're undermining people's ability to adapt to reality and communicate, to attack the pricing system or the weights and measures. Like that undermines our survival at the most fundamental level. It's, it's almost like a Tower of Babel thing where you'd say you just wipe out human language, right? If you just wipe human language in one fell swoop, how fucked would we be, right? We couldn't do anything. Yeah. And so it's telling to me that, that the one exception for Christ to get mad in the Bible is at the money changers. Like you have to listen to that. You have to at least wonder why. Why the money changers? Why was he so mad at the money changers? Um. There's a, there's a tweet we could look at in a second. I would say to you, this notion, you get really deep into this conversation about God. People are often thinking, oh, you believe in the guy in the sky, right? Like you you believe there's a guy in the sky that like makes sure everything's fine and like takes care of you. But if I don't believe it, I'm going to hell. It's a pretty weak interpretation, actually. Um, when I look at the history of that word God, it came from this Neoplatonic tradition and this the metaphysical notion of goodness, actually. Um, Plato wrote about this, right? The notion of the good. And it's, there's this, you can almost think about it as like the principle of unity itself. That there is, there's an underlying unity to reality. They called it the one, they called it the good. And this became uh, incorporated into Christian religion as God, right? That's what the word meant. And like for a, a, a technical philosophical definition, it's something like the structures of our intelligibility always seem to track the structures of reality. We can't prove that. We can't know that. We can't know that the laws of physics aren't different in some other part of the universe. We don't know that they're not going to be different tomorrow. It's all based on faith. It's an unprovable unprovable thing. So it's it's a faith that underpins all human enterprises, including science. You cannot engage in the scientific enterprise without faith in intelligibility tracking reality. So like there's the principle of unity, this idea of having a deep continuity between our perceptual faculties and what is real and that there is some underlying oneness or principle of unity to this whole thing, whatever all this is. Like that is where God came from. It's not some 
people sitting around a fire like this. Let's tell everyone there's a guy in the sky and we'll just make up a bunch of fairy tales. So I get so frustrated with when I'm talking to atheists about this, that they, they, they say things like, why not the flying spaghetti monster? I think it's the old Richard Dawkins point. So it's like, you're, you're almost, you're, you're really throwing the baby out with the bathwater, I think. And then this is a, a tweet from my friend, Brian Estes. And look, everything we're talking about right now, it's like, you're going to piss off Christians. You're going to piss off atheists. You're going to piss off Bitcoiners. It's like, there's no, you're just going to piss everyone off when you talk about this. <laughs> but I think this is an interesting observation. How is Bitcoin like Jesus? Well, there was an immaculate conception. It's a gift to the world. Loves everybody. Lives forever. Hated by the establishment. Brings peace. Flips the money changers tables. Central source of truth. It's moral and it started a revolution. I think I added some stuff to that too. If you don't <laughs> mind me looking that up real quick. Oh, I went on. I gave him 11 through 16 for this. I said it brought a moral software update for human hearts. It's ushering humanity into a higher echelon civilization. It's inspiring of righteousness, honesty, and growth in adherence to the code. It's alignment of word and deed, perfect integrity, and gave us freedom so that we may be free. So, you know, whatever your views are, we need human freedom is essential, right? To human flourishing and human freedom is not functioning in the current iteration of human socioeconomic self-organization. So we need to fix that. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, it's, we're, we're just a bunch of like apes playing in the dirt trying to describe the world with language like this infinite complex fluid reality trying to put little static words to it so i think that's where everyone gets super pissed off it's like no you know, it's, it's not god it's this it's 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 atheism i believe in nothingness it's like okay well then nothingness is your god like you're just swapping two words out um and i think too we've and john verveke's done a lot of good work on this we've just gotten we have forgotten how we got this far, right? The writings, the work of someone like Plato and Neoplatonism that gave us the idea of the good. Um, we now think that's a guy in the sky and it's not actually where it comes from. So it's frustrating. You know? Well, and it's interesting too how people want to separate that from money, which like you guys bring up in the book, money is the most mentioned thing in, in the bible i mean it's yeah. it's i don't know how thousands many hundreds of times. of times or thousands of times mm -hmm. it's it's mentioned because it is core to everything dude that's not because the bible is about money that's obviously right. not the focus of the bible but it was important enough to life yes. of everybody that they kept bringing up the importance of having a just money and so i think a lot of times people forget that or they gloss over that fact of right money is so core to everything that we do that if we don't have the money right nothing else is going that's to right. be right that's right it's an instrument of rationality and you know in the beginning there was the word the word was with god and the word was god am i saying that correctly the beginning was word and word was with god and word yeah yeah and the word translated from the greek term logos right which yeah. means word or ratio so the word itself is a medium of exchange of human conception, right? Like we're doing it right now. We're both running the open source software called English and I make a mouth sound and you decode it in your mind and you do it back to me. Like we're using a money of economic conception that we call language and real money that we're traditionally associated with, right? Like it is a medium of exchange for trade or human action, right? But it also propagates price signals. And the price is the exchange ratio between any two goods. So it's like, it's in the word, exchange ratio, right? Rationality, the logos. We can't have a rational market economy without accurate prices. 
It'd be like trying to have a, a fruitful conversation when the, the language is scrambled or you speak Chinese and I speak English. Like it's not going to happen. Yeah. It's not going to work. So all of the, it's not to say that we're not deifying money. We're just saying like this principle of the logos, right? It's, it's, we adhere to it with truthful speech, right? When we say things that are true or try to try not to lie, as Peterson says, like try to just get closer to the, the real truth with your words because the words never can quite get there because the, the map is never the territory sort of thing. Well, money is the same thing, right? It's just another critical communication system. Perhaps more critical than speech. I don't know. I think they're about on equal footing. We use speech a lot more, but money carries a lot more signal, right? Yeah. And when you screw that one up, I mean, look around the world. That's what we're doing right now. English works great. The money does not. So clearly we need more than just English to fix the problems in the world. Well, and, and bad financial systems have killed far more people than, yes. than any weapons of war in the world. Right. So it's... They uh, fund war. Yeah. That's what central banking is, right? Yeah. The history of central banking and the history of warfare are just like wrapped around one axle. Yeah. So it, it really speaks to like a deeper moral dimension to existence. Like whether it exists actually in the fabric of reality or it's just a matter of once a human tells a lie, it tends to snowball into more lies and maybe even destruction itself in the form of warfare, violence, whatever. That's what we're talking about removing, right? Removing the deceptiveness from human relations. That's what Bitcoin's doing. It's like no more bullshitting in the money. It's just it, it is what it says it is. It does exactly what it says it will do. It never stops working. It's always there. It's always on, right? Perfect integrity, like these other things he said i mean, for, it's for, hard not to get it's hard not to see it at that level and not get really excited yeah. about it and we do sound crazy i'll give it to you <laughs> rewind the clock five or seven years and play this back to me back then i'm like that guy's fucking crazy don't listen to him but you look around there's a lot of smart people getting sucked yeah. into this rabbit hole and smart people with good hearts you know like i don't know anywhere there's nowhere else in the world where i'm excited about the quality of people as I am in Bitcoin. It's like all walks of life, super competent, good values. Obviously, I'm generalizing here, right? There's people of all sorts and there's exceptions and yeah. all that, but Bitcoin is special, man. The people in Bitcoin make me more bullish about Bitcoin than anything else, even Bitcoin itself. And that's saying something. Yeah. No, when you're in town, when there's a Bitcoin conference, especially if it's a a real kind of core Bitcoin conference, just the interactions you have, even at the restaurants or people you meet, it's at a different level. I mean, yeah. it really is is different. Yeah, and it's hard to explain. It's the that opposite to of Bitcoin Twitter, basically. Yeah, <laughs> Bitcoin Twitter is just a shit show of people arguing and talking smack, and then you yeah. see them in real life, and yeah. everyone's just hugging and smiling, and it's yeah. funny how that my, works. My wife does not like Bitcoiners on Bitcoin Twitter, but she yeah. likes going to the conferences. She's like, Yeah, I don't either. I mean, they're people are kind of weird, but they're all really nice. So <laughs> yeah. she's uh, always laughing about that. Yeah, I prefer the Bitcoiners IRL. Bitcoin Twitter is uh, can be a bit rough yeah. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> one uh, one thing that's been really neat for me being here in El Zante is a lot of things we're talking about tonight. We've been able to see those things actually kind of work themselves out in people as they start earning Bitcoin for the first mm. time, transacting in Bitcoin, and that was something that was really surprising to me. I didn't. You know, I believe that the money was very important and it was corrupting all these things, but I didn't necessarily think that just people earning Bitcoin and spending Bitcoin would transform the way they think. Right. But it really does transform people's time preferences. Yeah. We've seen in El Salvador, there's no real culture of savings, but people, once they start earning Bitcoin, they start really thinking before they spend it because they know the value of it and that maybe I should wait and I'll be able to buy more with it in the future. Yeah. So it it causes them not to stop spending totally, but to really, sure. you know, weigh the cost of spending now versus later. And that that kind of ripples into all the decisions they make, going on to school for more education, yes. bettering their their health, all of those things. It's and, and I never would have predicted that, but I've seen it kind of play out. It's it's phenomenal, honestly. And that simple idea again that just a positive incentive framework, right? Where people, where, where justice reigns, where people can keep the fruits of their labor, right? With a high degree of assurance. 
all of a sudden they can plan into the future. And it's at the micro level, the grassroots level is how it starts, but the macro expression of that is civilization, right? The, the Austrians have argued this, like civilization is an expression of how low our time preference is. Like the more capital we have accumulated, the less uncertain the future, so the lower our time preference, right? Whereas if we're in a very capital constrained situation, we don't know how we're going to eat tomorrow. We don't know how we're going to have shelter. Like you're, you're coming from a place of fear and anxiety. Yeah. Whereas if you can accumulate a base of capital beneath yourself, then you don't have to be quite so fearful or so anxious. You can just be more civilized. Like it's, it's so simple that maybe that makes it almost hard to believe. And people are like, what do you mean? Like you just give people a reliable means of savings and all of a sudden they take a longer term time horizon. And if everyone does that, then the whole, civilization has a longer term time horizon and we're more peaceful and prosperous but i don't see like where's the hole in that argument well i think we're going to see that argument actually play out here in el salvador it's not going to happen in one or two years no. but i think on a, a 10 year time horizon you're going to see a country transformed from one of the countries with the worst metrics to a country with some of the best metrics in health and life expectancy and crime and economic prosperity and I think that's going to be something that's hard for people to argue against when they see it yeah. actually in concrete form. For sure. And I, I, I hope, I really hope that's the case, but there's still, there's a lot of battles to be fought, right? Again, Bitcoin fixes a lot, but it doesn't fix everything. And changes this big, you know, if it's on par with the printing press, you know, these things take decades and centuries to really play out. So I'm always reticent to give people timelines yeah. or like what happens in 10 years? What happens in 15 years? I'm like, I don't know. Does it take five years? Does it take 50? Does it take 500? I'm not really sure. I can just look at the economic incentives and give you a trajectory that I think things will go. But to try to put that to a timeline is, is difficult. And again, I haven't been in El Salvador long. I'm sure there's many, many, many problems in this country as there are in all countries. I'm sure there's a lot of things to fix. I don't think Bitcoin can fix all of them, but people with clear minds and you know good hearts come down here and do the work, right? Proof of work. Maybe we can really build something that's an example for other countries to follow. Um, there's no other way to do it, yeah. frankly, right? You can, we can, theorize and talk and blah, blah, blah until we're blue in the face, but you ultimately have to get out there and do the fucking work. So I'm, I'm excited that it's happening here and I hope to be a part of it to whatever extent I can be. No, hopefully you'll uh, come back here and uh, maybe broadcast some episodes of your show uh, right from this, uh, this podcast studio. Uh, yeah. I know you want to get up and surf in the morning, so uh, we'll, we'll wrap things up here, but what what can we point people to? Um, I know you have your podcast. Um, what, where else can people find you or follow you? Oh, or? there it is. There I am. <laughs> what is moneypodcast.com? And that's the picture you'll see. Um, the, the, the best looking guy in Bitcoin, right? Isn't oh, that thank you. you? <laughs> that's, that's saying something, right? <laughs> um, that's, yeah, I'm on Twitter at breedlove22 doing the show three episodes a week, um, trying to put out as much high signal content as I can. I'm really going down these rabbit holes as deep as I can, trying to learn as much as I can, talking to the smartest people that will talk to me about these crazy things. And um, I've been very fortunate. You know, I've learned a lot doing the show and I really enjoy it. I love what I do and brings me to cool places like this get to talk to cool people like you and um yeah i hope people will find it interesting and valuable all right we'll have to uh next time you're down here do a kind of a recap and see what your thoughts are in el salvador after being here for a while but i'm excited you made this first short trip and uh hopefully uh, you'll call this home someday we're seeing more and more bitcoiners kind of flock to here and that's what makes it so fun to be here you mm -hmm. see all these People are really doing really cool things that are now making El Salvador home. So mm. I'm always an advocate for El Salvador. So I'm always going to shill uh, life <laughs> here. But uh, but well, thanks thanks for spending time with us. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll we'll see you out in the water tomorrow. Sounds good, man. Thank you for yeah. having me.